Okay, we're going to continue our video series today on the octave wave, the universal one, carbon 60, hydrogen water, all of these subjects, orgone energy, are to me all tied up into the same thing. And so the primary reference book that I am using here is called The Universal One by Walter Russell, originally written in 1926. And I have scanned many of the um, drawings that he's put into the book. So this version was first put to print in 1968, and I think this is the third or fourth printing. And it's easily available out there if you want to go and, and buy your own copy. If you're going to be stuck in a deserted island or on a very long plane flight, this is the best book to take. So let's get into it a little bit. So. This is the painting of the octave wave by Walter Russell. And so, energetically speaking, this is the way that it looked to him in his mind's eye. And I want to just talk a little bit about this painting as far as um, some of the other drawings that get into the very specific mathematics of how this works. This is ultimately what we need to keep in mind as the visual for the way that the, that really the elective wave of the universe is working. 10 octave cycle, this right here is the octave wave. So starting right here with the cathode, which is male, going up through the different four pressure zones. So one, two, three, and then four. And then each one of these pressure zones here has to have an equal and opposite over here in the same octave. All right, so these are equal and simultaneous the way that it works and they're building pressure up until when you get this right here, which is the amplitude element. And so this is the anode, which is female. This is the cathode, which is male. <clears throat> so this is another one, another view of all the 10 octave cycle going from the first, the beginning and the end in the first octave, and he named it Alpha Non. But really, we start with hydrogen in the fourth octave and the fifth octave, which is carbon right here. And, and there's three or four of these, you know, all the way up to the ninth from the, the fourth through the ninth octave are common elements that scientists use every single day. Prior to that, we can't even detect anything prior to hydrogen. Okay, so zoom in a little bit here. Okay, so hydrogen is the only one within this fourth octave that man has identified, been able to test and identify. Carbon is the amplitude element. So when we were talking about the, the painting, if you view that center amplitude element as carbon, and then it's starting from the inertial line, so everything here is the inertial plane. Let's go back into the periodic table of the elements. And then zoom in to hydrogen. Alright, so we look at hydrogen right here and just the atomic radius. So 0.37 shows that it has the smallest atomic radius of any of the other elements. And then they have gold here in the middle that they're comparing it to. So gold atomic radius is 1.44 and of course the atomic weight is much higher too. And so what this shows is that as mass builds time it also builds mass and it builds energy. And so the atomic radius, that's why hydrogen has the most potential energy because it is expanding is in the least expanded state 
of any of the other elements and it will expand eventually throughout the whole octave wave cycle. And so this is why carbon is at the middle of this whole um, you know, red half is considered male on the cathode and then um, Russell has a drawing here of basically what you see out in space all the time, which is a planet, uh, usually you know, <coughs> a planet that has already uh, spiraled away from its sun, and it's like Saturn, and it's halfway in between mass and plane. And so you can see that this is what happens to all matter, is that it's basically spinning all this matter back out through its vortex is the way that it wound up originally and so now this is all spinning back out into its inertial planes. <clears throat> so I think it's very interesting that um, you know we have all these different documents to look at that he put together that if put into a computer program would probably allow us to manufacture elements. That's what this really would allow us to do. I mean if you look at things like the Moxie reactor which is basically a cathode and an anode and it's you know creating things like carbon-60 well you know we could do that in a controlled environment with the inertial planes and um, you know maybe an organ filled environment and then we could probably get to the point of creating energy and creating anything like the, the replicator. That's what this really is, is a guide towards creating every single element and how matter combines. So he's gone through and given us an example of the way that the octave wave comes together. It's very simple because everything in nature has to be simple. That's why it's balanced. And so the ratios, you know, he's got all these ratios right here, <coughs> you know, and he kind of puts it together almost like a piano keyboard. And this is why we have, you know, eight notes and an octave on the piano is because the octave wave is what makes everything work. And that's why naturally, since it's a tonal universe, the octave wave applies to music as well as everything else. <clears throat> okay. So Good to reread, you know, his comments only on these charts because people have their own opinions of what that really means. And so, if I try to read other comments on these pictures that exist in other material, I find that they just confuses me more. So, you know, this dimension chart number five: distance, dimension of tonal relations. All mass has a measurable tonal relation to all other mass. All potential of energy is active, orderly displacement of inactive inertia, the ratios of which are measurable in all dimensions. And so really the key to, you know, the things that we need, to, like free energy and things like that, is to recognize that there is a tonal element of the octave wave in addition to all the other dimensions that Walter Russell has identified. Right, so this to me is, <clears throat> well, what he said was this was a chart of crystallization and the way that everything combines and so you've got hardness, simplicity, softness, complexity, 
and it looks like a kaleidoscope to me. And so this is basically the way that the the universal one's energy is distributed through the octave wave and combines in the physicality that we have, so all the elements that perform and create all of our physicality. And this just lays right on top of the vortex of the other views that we've shown. So carbon, <coughs> okay, let's start with hydrogen right here first. So hydrogen is 401 plus, and then the amplitude element goes to carbogen, and then the helium is the um, is the anode. <coughs> and so then carbon over here is the amplitude element of the fifth octave, and neon is the other um, inertial plane that governs the fifth octave and so helium <coughs> you know and it's coming from helium so it came there was a negative from helium to create this and at the same time a positive from helium to create carbon and at the simultaneously a negative from neon to produce these elements over here and then a positive from neon to produce silicon blah 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 and that's the way that the octave wave works it's <coughs> why alternating current works I and mean, this back and forth between pulses you know explains um, the electrical wave even though the electrical wave dynamics that we have today do not reflect the four poles that we should be reflecting which is this and this is one pole and they're equal and opposite beryllium and oxygen are equal and opposite, and boron and nitrogen are equal and opposite. Okay, and so <coughs> if you go into the next one, all right, so sodium and chloride, let's look at that one real quick. So each one of these elements, okay, so sodium chloride, is that, that's salt, okay. Each one of these will combine to be a perfect cube shape. So magnesium, sulfide, same thing, aluminum, phosphate, and then you have silicon. Okay, and then lithium fluoride, beryllium oxide, boron, <coughs> um, let's see, I'll call that boron. Anyway, boron nitrogen combine to form a very high temperature product that's used in all of the things that um, have high heat production. And I can't remember the exact name of that thing, but you know, very interesting because it does predict every single thing that we have in nature. And so the fourth octave, once again, carbogen, so it starts off with hydron, an inert gas that we don't know about. So hydrogen is the first one at 401, carbogen, and then it goes into the fifth octave. The fifth octave, we know about all of these elements in mainstream. And so carbon, at the this explains why you have carbon, the amplitude element, as the highest melting point. <coughs> and so he has labeled all of these with a number, going all the way up to all the different octaves. And so carbon is at the very center of this 10 octave cycle. Okay. Now this gets into the shape of the universe so we are carbon based life forms and we are in the Milky Way galaxy which is also a carbon based life form so the Milky Way itself is the same exact thing as the atom it is in the mental middle of you know it is the amplitude element so to speak galaxy of all the galaxies that make up that octave wave of galaxies up there we just you know haven't been shown that in, in nature, but that's the way that it truly does exist. If they were to look at it as a vortex, this would be at the amplitude element of that. And this is what it looks like as a carbon ecliptic, which is our Milky Way galaxy. Now some galaxies out there you look at, well, they're in the first one, so it's very fuzzy, you can't really see them, and they're only in that hydrogen phase, so it's the first pressure zone, then you go to the second pressure zone, 
then the third, and then click, click both of those pressure zones. Now you have three poles on each side, um, producing this fourth pressure zone of carbon. Chart number two, structure of the atom. All effects of motion are repetitive. Size is purely relative. The heavens swarm with replicas of the atoms of all of the elements with the knowledge of basic laws that may all be measured and classified. And so he's given us a lot of these ratios right here that we could <coughs> say, for example, somebody that's very industrious out there with a 3D printer could play around with some of these shapes and, and volumes and come up with a way to um, put this in together that could create, you know, a current flow. And therefore it would be basically a way to amplify um, gravity and the ambient energy of the Earth. And this is what Tesla did. So, um, this is one view of universal mathematics. <coughs> Okay, this is another view. Right, so you got the first dimension, which is length. Okay, length or distance. Alright. And go eight, four, two, one. So this is the fourth pressure zone, third second and first. So you got the length of the first pressure zone would be this, and then the length of the second pressure zone would be that, and then the second one would be breadth or dimension. And so you got 64, 16, 4, 1, and then volume. So the third dimension which would be volume or thickness which is 512 down to 64 and dividing by 8 all the way down. mentioned chart number one, distance, area, and volume ratios in contracting and expanding units of all expressions of motion. This means all of physicality. And one other view. So the fourth pressure zone. <coughs> Alright, so the first pressure zone, you've got all of these different pressure zones that are still separate. And so it's very loose and it's very fuzzy because you've got them all out there and they're not really in focus. And so this will be the length <coughs> and then the volume of this one would be the whole area. Okay, then they combine, okay, two of each one of these combines because it, it moves one more. Um, movement of the universal clock is the way he describes it. So it's it's the movement of the clock. Once it started, the octave wave cannot be stopped. So third pressure zone, you only have four of them left, and then in the fourth pressure zone, all become one. Everything is completely in focus. So universal ratio means that all dimensions are pressure dimensions. All dimensions simultaneously expand and contract in opposite directions at the same ratio. With distance, plane, and area dimensions given, any planet or satellite in the solar system can be measured in all its dimensions by contracting or expanding the standard units of this planet in universal ratios. So, I mean, if we really um, get the smart people on the planet to study these, I think it really could give us a lot more control over gravity, electricity, and things like that. So dimension chart number two, nature divides all of our expressions of energy into octave and octaves and tones of equal constants of unequal dimensions. The dimensional relations of octaves and tones vary in ratios which are absolute and universal. Mm -hmm. yeah, think about that for a while. <coughs> And so here is a little bit more on how things will come together. So if you look at sodium and chloride, we talked about before, sodium chloride will come together with explosive violence. They will shed any other chemical in their presence, and they will um, 
come together at ordinary temperature because their exact tonal mates are of opposite sexes and their orbits are in the same low pressure zone where integration is more easily affected. The degree of willingness of this series known as the halogens to combine with sodium is in the order indicated by the numbers. So you know, this is predicting the way that each one of these elements will combine with each other. And this can means that we can apply this to the way that all of the elements will combine with each other. Uh, but this is definitely not taught in the schools. <coughs> So one more thing on salt, and so salt <coughs> will not recombine with anything else. So it's why that you know we can it's the most stable and balanced environment. And they put all the uh, paintings that they want to preserve forever down in the salt caves. That's because nothing will combine. Once it's combined with sodium and chloride, uh, it will take the um, power of an arc to separate them. And so you would have to put it into a moxie reactor to really get it to separate back into sodium chloride. So that is all the scans that we're going to talk about today. Um, so the octave wave. This explains the volcano, all the um, tornadoes and hurricanes, and all the way that that phenomena um, occur, and the universal mathematics around those can all be discerned from the universal one. So, um, you know, since we live in this octave wave, what does that mean? Well, you know, some people say like Cliff High says that this is moving at 30 trillion frames a second. So if you look at, all right, one pressure zone is a frame. Okay, well then it goes this one and this one fire at the same time. This are equal and opposite. Then that one and that one. Then this one and this one. And then you have this one. And so all of those are, to me, one now moment that is moving through, you know, the universe. And we just can only see the continuation of all of these because it's moving so quickly. But there's only still frames in life. You know, this is what Walter Russell was talking about. And that we are all one because we are mind and God is putting us through that kaleidoscope that we looked at before, which is crystallization, this one right here. <coughs> and so you think about the universal one, which is just mind, and then all of us are appearing within this octave wave environment. And it's simply because the universal one mind, think of this as a sphere, and it's projecting its own light into the projector that's moving at 30 trillion, 30 trillion frames a second. And so if we're able to perceive that we're really all one, it goes back to, well, we can kind of see above the octave wave, and therefore it takes us back into just being one with the universe. But this is the variation of life that's out there. And this is the extent of how it will look. It will be, you know, hardness and complexity and simplicity and generative and radiation, all those things are predicted by the Walter Russell uh, Universal One. Let's go back to you know how everything moves through this octave wave cycle. You know, and you can see it down here, just kind of combined into a straight line. Um, but you know, under, understanding how to you know turn water into wine, well, we just need to take water and then apply the right dimensions to that water to create the wine that we like. 
and then that's how the replicator is going to be produced. So, you know, we haven't got to that point yet. You guys have a good one.